looking for me. All right, welcome guys to a new box of devlog. Uh, this past few weeks I've been working on quite a few things that took me a while to get it to work, but in the end the result is pretty good, so I'm gonna share it with you all uh, today. So if you remember from last time, I had a small issue where basically a small parts of my terrain uh, would not get generated. And this was just a really, really dumb issue because I basically just have a basic loop to generate my terrain around the player. And in this loop, I was basically uh, putting a break instead of a continue right there, uh, which means that if a region fails to load, the next regions in the list uh, just get discarded, so it will not be processed and loaded, which was just a dumb issue and an easy fix. So the next thing that I did was to actually resize the regions in the world because until now um, each region, basically each voxel in the region was taking one unit of space in the world which was pretty big. This meant that the player would face some precision issues really quickly in the world because the positions are encoded in float, float32 and there were some limitations in the precision that they can have. So now basically instead of having one voxel is equal to 1 meter, I have one voxel is equal to 20 over 256, which is the resolution of each region in the world. So it took me some time to make it work, because if I change the size of the voxels um, in the rendering algorithm, I need to change how the ray tracing functions uh, work to actually ray trace those voxels. But after a few bug fixes, I made it work and it was looking pretty nice and also I did not have to move hundreds of uh, meters just to get across a few regions in the world. So the next step was to actually scale up the world so that um, in the terrain generation system we can have uh, bigger mountains overall. And this is the new terrain generation. Um, you can definitely see the difference between before and uh, now. We have way bigger mountains and overall the, the world just appears bigger and it gives a really solid foundation for uh, the next steps and future devlogs uh, where we will actually improve the terrain generation of our with caves and trees and everything and actual colors. In this short clip you can see that I've reduced the memory footprint overall from 4GB to 1GB and this is because I've been compacting the octaries when they come out of the compute shader but uh, later on in the video you'll see that I've reverted this change and instead restructured the whole um, SVO approach. Now another problem that I had was the chunk generation speed overall. And this is because I was actually generating one chunk at a time and sending this chunk to uh, the rendering pipeline um, on each frame. So this means that basically the chunk generation was capped um, by the frame rate, uh, which was really bad. So the chunks are generated around the player uh, from minus 16 to plus 16 on the Y axis for now. Um, and it's very, very slow and I had to do something about it. And this is where I thought about uh, actually processing multiple chunks in one dispatch of compute shader and then sending multiple chunks um, per frame to actually make the generation go faster and boom easy speed up way faster generation and this is because i basically um, process a maximum of 32 chunks by frame uh, 32 is because i need to limit the amount of chunks that i send to the compute shader um, otherwise it's just gonna crash because it takes too much time to process the next thing I did was to actually add normals to the voxels um, because I wanted to see if each voxel is rendered properly and without um, any lighting at all it's very difficult to see if each voxel is rendered uh, properly. Um, but in this clip the resolution is not maximum. Uh, I think it's 128 so LOD1 just the resolution before uh, the finest details. But the LOD um, was working pretty nicely uh, the normals too and I was ready to move on to the next step. And this next step was to actually be able to iterate over uh, the rendering uh, algorithm much faster and this involved uh, implementing the shader hot reloading which is basically recompiling uh, the shader at runtime which uh, gives the ability to iterate over shaders while the app is running. 
in this clip I'm just updating the normals uh, of the voxels um, just to show you that it's working pretty well uh, at runtime. The next thing I wanted to add to the visuals was uh, shadows. So I implemented ray tracing shadows. I just needed to update the DDA algorithm to uh, work properly with rays that are not cast from the player. Um, but basically from anywhere in the world and this gives me a very very good result overall. So the next thing that I wanted to try was using raw DDA which is basically uh, traversing uh, a 3D grid of the world uh, and checking if each voxel that the ray goes over um, is valid or not. And this was really not efficient and to make it efficient I will need to implement um, acceleration techniques like uh, assign distance fields and everything which was really not worth the time to uh, implement them since I already had an auxiliary representation that is fast to traverse. But the DDA algorithm is very interesting and I learned a lot uh, during this implementation phase. And with a bit of time I'm definitely sure that you can make a very efficient DDA algorithm overall to traverse voxels. And so the last thing that I did uh, this once was to actually restructure my auxiliary representation of the world. Since until now I had uh, one node in the octree buffer be a 16-bit variable which was the data of the current voxel and an array of 8 ints which was the indices to its uh, node children. This meant that each node in the buffer was actually 34 bytes and this is because I basically stored each index of each children uh, in the node um, and this was very very inefficient so I moved away from this technique and actually used a bit mask. So with the new technique I basically moved away from uh, using an SVO, so a sparse voxel octree, um, and just use an octree representation with a bit mask so that I can calculate the children uh, position in the array depending on its position in the world. So now each node in the uh, octree buffer is one single 32-bit uh, variable and in the last 8-bit of this variable I store uh, the children bit mask for this variable and so depending on the octant that is set or not set in the child bit mask of a node I can basically calculate its uh, node index in the array uh, using the parent node index and the octant index in that child bit mask. This means that I basically moved from a 34 bytes uh, variable for each node to only 4 bytes of uh, memory used for each node in each region of the world. Which means that it is a memory saving of around 8.5 times, which is really really great. So this is a really really big saving and this also simplifies the traversal and the chunk generation process a lot. And that wraps it up for today. Um, basically, it opens the door for uh, dynamic modification, creation, and deletion of regions in the world. So, thank you everyone. I hope uh, that you like this episode as much as uh, you did for uh, the past first two. I've seen that uh, lots of you guys uh, watched the first uh, two episodes and you really seem to like it. So, it gives even more motivation to continue working on this project. And I really thank you for that, and I hope to uh, see you soon in the next devlog. Until then, I wish you all a very good day, and I see you next time.